In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, as we heard Eleanor read for us in the Old Testament lesson, it's moving day for Abraham. Anybody think moving is fun? (laughs) Packing up all the china, climbing up into the attic to haul down all the stuff you haven't used for years and never will, but you have to take it with you anyway. Draining the oil and gas out of the lawnmower, carting the pets and the children in a car already overloaded, praying the movers don't break something, and they always do. Or if you're a doer yourselfer, praying that the climb up the stairs with a piano will give you a heart attack and kill you. <laughs> and of course, on every, rain, on every moving day, it always rains, right? How many of you like change, even little changes? Big changes, changes of job description, changes in schedule. Someone who worked her entire life in a federal bureaucracy once told me that every single time they got the bugs out of something and it was finally working right, notice came from on high that there had to be changes and they would go back to the old system, which didn't work. Remember a couple of years ago when Facebook blackmailed us by making us either get Messenger, the app on our phone, or we could never see our messages again? Or what does it feel like to go to sleep at night and while you are blissfully asleep, Microsoft updates your computer? (laughs) And you wake up in the morning and you can't find a thing. Or what if we were quarantined on a cruise ship this morning? Oh, wouldn't that be fun? (laughs) Change is not easy. In fact, it can be very stressful, as we all know. In our morning scriptures today, we find two individuals, Nicodemus, about whom we just heard in the gospel, and Abram, Abraham. And boy, do they deal with change very differently. Abraham astounds us. At age 75, God says to him, you have accumulated many possessions, you are very established and prosperous, and you have friends and family right here. Everything you've ever known your entire life, so familiar. Well, guess what? Get up. Leave it all behind. Go to a place you've never seen, and I promise you, I will make you the father of of a great nation. And Abraham simply said, okay. Now we know there's a little bit more to the story. Abraham kept his end of the bargain. He moved and he waited and he waited and he waited and he waited and he waited. What is this father of a mighty nation stuff all about? There's just me and the little old lady. To which Sarah replied, don't call me old, you're as good as dead, old man. (laughs) And yet children were born, Ishmael to the servant girl Hagar, through whom Islam traces its lineage to Abraham. And Isaac, Yitzhak, which means laughter in Hebrew, the father of Jacob, the father of Joseph, who went down to Egypt, from which Moses led them out once again, this time to conquer the land and to make it their own, a land flowing with milk and honey, the promised land of God's chosen people. And it all started when one old man, with every normal, intuitive human instinct, should have said no, said yes instead. It is for this reason that we heard St. Paul say in the epistle this morning, that Abraham's faith foreshadowed faith in Jesus Christ. Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. That is to say, the very act of believing made him righteous in God's eyes and not through any work or effort that he could perform. Likewise, the author of the book of Hebrews uses Abraham as the chief witness amongst many who exemplified in their lives the verse, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the knowledge of things as of yet unseen. So Abraham gets an A on his report card, right? 
Hold on to him for just a minute. Let's visit with Nicodemus. Like Abraham, he is successful in terms of worldly things. He's very well educated. He has rank and position. He is a Pharisee, a teacher, a holy leader in the household of God. And he comes to see Jesus, but he does it at night, secretly. He doesn't want anyone to know. Why? Because Jesus makes the establishment very nervous. He doesn't seem to play by the rules. In fact, when the rules get in the way of what Jesus calls love. He seems willing every single time to toss the rules out and to err on the side of compassion instead. And the establishment does not like this. Nicodemus is very drawn to Jesus, but he's afraid. Why? Because at this point in his life, his status is more important to him than perhaps truth. Have you ever felt that tension in your life? We all grow and mature and change and the things that we think that we know and believe firmly in our teens and 20s and 30s are not necessarily the same things that we hold later in life. Perhaps you've reached a time in your life when your consciousness has been raised and you see the world and people and especially people who are different in a way that you didn't just the day before. The suffering of someone suddenly catches your attention. You empathize with them. You want to be their advocate, but sometimes, even as you begin to feel that way, you are frozen by fear. Why? Because you know that if you act on what your conscience is now telling you, the establishment won't like you either. They will squeeze you right out of their inner circle out of your place of comfort, maybe even your place of power. And if you stand with the marginalized, you risk being marginalized yourself. Those are the choices that Nicodemus faced that night when he came to see Jesus. That's what he risked if he dared. And so this teacher of Israel who knows much and understands little has a conversation with Jesus. Jesus tries to explain to him what rebirth is, what being born from above means, how being recreated with a heart of love is not the same thing as writing a systematic theology textbook. Perhaps Nicodemus is who St. Paul had in mind when he said, if I can speak with the tongue of men and of angels, but have not love. I'm a clanging gong and a noisy symbol. The conversation continues, but it doesn't really go very far. Jesus actually seems exasperated, doesn't he? Are you a teacher of Israel and yet you have no comprehension yourself? If you cannot understand earthly things, how can you possibly expect to understand (laughs) spiritual things? And the conversation comes to an end with that wonderful Bible verse that is written on bed sheets and hung in the end zone of football games. John 3.16 God so loved the world that he gave his only son that the world through him might be saved. Wouldn't it be important if we would hang in the end zone the next verse, verse 17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. So what is our takeaway this morning from all of this? What nugget can we put in our spiritual pockets after the dismissal is said and the candles are extinguished? For me, and this is as relevant today as it was 2,000 years ago, whenever you encounter a religious system or leader that tries to manipulate your thoughts or opinion through fear, leave. Put down their books, close their hymnals, shake off the dust behind you, and walk deliberately away. God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, nor scare it, nor threaten it with hell. Fear mongers, conspiracy theorists, by whatever title, are not from God. 
Secondly, remember that Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath, who called it to be a day of rest, can, if he chooses, heal on the Sabbath, dance on the Sabbath, go to a party on the Sabbath, if it serves the need of love. We all like the boundaries of our faith and time-honored traditions, but we must not be so bound by them that we fail to see what is possible with God. Are there problems in this old world? You betcha. In the government, in the church, in our healthcare system, name whatever you want to. In our hearts. Fear not. Challenges are but opportunities. A child of promise was born to a very old couple. The Red Sea parted. Water became wine. The word was made flesh. The impossible happened. And Nicodemus? Well, we don't close the chapter on him with verse 3, 17, do we? We meet him one more time. Anybody remember where? He and Joseph of Arimathea are there at the cross. And when the body of Jesus is taken down and placed in the arms of his mother, in love and compassion, those two men arranged for him to be buried in a tomb with no extravagance spared. For love has no price. Nicodemus The spirit blows where it wills. You cannot contain it or control it. And you will exhaust yourself if you try. But let your heart be born new. And on the third day, you will be astounded. In the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.